Okay, folks. I was able to make a A few copies of the slides, I, I, enough for everybody in here. But no point nagging, your project is due no, soon. Soon, you know when, right? So you know, get it done, if it's not done. If it's done already, great. I know, notice quite a few of, please keep that subject. I know it sounds trivial, but this, today I'll probably get 350 projects in the three classes, and if they don't go into the right place, God help me. Now, I'll find yours eventually, but I'll have to be looking through, so if, please, uh, I don't even remember, that. what is it? It's uh, the grand finale. Uh, the, for the corporate finance, was the torture ends. And um, so with each one, I had to pick something different. So just try to keep to that. So, uh, I... I teach the, the same class to the undergraduates, so I kind of collected all your summary sheets together, and there were 686 companies for which I got summaries. So along the, time, along the course of today, I will talk about what you found as undervalued, overvalued, what the cheapest stocks, most expensive stocks. Then I'll leave you with a challenge, a challenge which I think if you take, then I'll go along with you at the end of the presentation. But I thought I'd make this part review session and part looking at the class. Right? So as I thought about how best to frame the review session, okay, I mean, if you think about it, there are three basic ways of putting a number on a company. It's discounted cash flow evaluation with all its you know, cash flows, growth, and risk. But let's face it, you have to make a lot of guesses and a lot of assumptions and hope and prayer kind of hold them together and you come up with the value. There's pricing where you look at what other people are paying for, what you call comparable, and let's put quotes around the word comparable because you stretch that definition and say this is what the right pricing should be. And for some of your stocks, there is that extra premium you added because there's option adding, but one in 10 stocks. So three basic approaches, and I thought I'd spend some time doing a very quick review of the intrinsic value part because if you get that, then you get the pricing part and the option price. Everything is built on that. So the framework I'm going to use is actually a book that all of us probably read in college or were asked to read, Dante's Inferno. I read the Cliff Notes version of it. This guy was a deeply disturbed Italian. Because you have to be deeply disturbed to be, if you ever read Inferno, it's about layers of hell and deep Catholic guilt going with layers of hell. So it's kind of, you kind of bring them together, you have Dante's Inferno. So I thought I'd describe a process where I took you through the intrinsic value setup, because setup is pretty simple. Where you take the cash flows from existing assets, you discount those cash flows back at a cost of capital, you come up with the value of the operating assets, you add cash. You say, We've done this a hundred times in the course. So what I will do is actually take you through a series of tests. And with each test, you get into a deeper layer of health. So I'll start with the kind of, 
I don't know, there are layers of sins, right? We start with the small sins and we go deeper and deeper. Hopefully none of you by the time you get to the deepest layers are going to make the kinds of mistakes that will leave you there. So we're going to start with what I call the base year fixation. I'm going to give you a test. We're going to run through the, what I call the base year fixation. Then we're going to talk about how to deal with taxes. There are so many wrong ways of dealing with taxes, only one right way. So let's talk about that. Talk about high growth. Talk about discount rates very quickly. Talk about growth and whether you're paying for growth. Come to the cost of capital and allow the debt ratio to change over time. See how the cost of capital changes. That terminal value, that big number, and definitely not to be treated as an ATM. The garnishing we do after we say we're done. Then getting from aggregate to per share value. And finally, we'll revisit a test we ran in session two. And let's see if you remember the right discount rate to use on cash flows. Ready? Let's start the test. Let's say you're valuing Exxon Mobil. In March of 2009, I give you the 2008 numbers. Here's what they look like. Revenues, after tax, EBIT, net capex, change in working capital, free cash flow to the firm. So I've computed the free cash flow to the firm. I tell you the cost of capital Exxon Mobil is 8%. And let's say you use a 2% growth rate in perpetuity, which you're allowed to use. It's close to the inflation rate. And the market cap of the firm is $373 billion. There's $10 billion in debt outstanding. If I gave you just those numbers, free cash flow to the firm in the most recent year, 2% growth rate, 8% cost of capital. Roughly speaking, how much will the value of the operating assets of ExxonMobil be? It's going to be 54 divided by 0 0.08 minus 0 0.02, which is 0 0.06. That's $900 billion. Either you've got the most undervalued stock in history or we're missing something big. So I want you to tell me, there are only three numbers I use, right? Free cash flow to the firm, cost of capital growth rate. One of those numbers must be off to be this far above the market price. So which of those three numbers do you think is the culprit? The free cash flow to the firm. Is what, I mean, I computed based on last year's numbers. I, I'm not making any assumptions. These are the actual free cash flow to the firm last year. It depends on oil prices. 2008 was a high oil price year, and I take that free cash flow to the firm and I'm building in. I'm going to come up with this hugely inflated value. This is a base year fixation. We so often build valuations of the most recent year. And if you have a commodity company or a cyclical company, if that base year is off, you're going to come up with strange values. So what's the solution? What are the, what are the two things I can do? I can do it normalized by looking at what my income would be. Or remember Royal Dutch, I recomputed the operating income based on today's oil price. If I do that, I'll get a very different free cash flow to the firm. With commodity and cyclical companies, this is so easy a trap to fall into, especially if what you do is modeling. Take an Excel spreadsheet and project things out. Let's move forward. Let's talk about taxes. Let's suppose I came to you with an income statement. EBIT, da, da, EBIT, interest expense, taxable income, taxes, net income. So I've given you all the numbers. I even give you the equation for free cash flow of the firm in case you've forgotten the equation, which you shouldn't. Assume that this company's cash flows will be constant forever. There's a 0% growth rate. What's the free cash flow of the firm? Now, what seems to be missing? What have I not given you? I've not given you capex, and I've not given you change in working capital, right? But why, in this particular case, can I get away with that? My cash flows are constant. There's no growth. Therefore, my reinvestment is zero. So all I need is my after-tax operating income, right? So what's the after-tax operating income of this firm? Let's see. If we're... Anybody want to try what's the after? It seems obvious, right? It's EBIT is 100. Taxes are 32. Well, should it be 68? If I use the 68, which is the wrong answer, what, what am I doing wrong? Because I'm taking EBIT and I'm subtracting our taxes. I'm including the tax savings I'm going to get. But isn't that a real savings? Why shouldn't I include it? But why? Why shouldn't I include the tax savings from interest income? I understand. I mean, I should do the tax rate first. But tell me the into. No, it's not actually, right? Interest expense is actually a tax savings. But because it's already in your discount. 
because I'm discounting at the cost of capital, which has, in fact, if I want to use 68 million, I can, but then you know how I should compute the cost of capital? I should use a pre-tax cost of debt. I'll get exactly the same answer. The reason we do not include the interest income from cash is because it's already in the cost of capital, which means to compute my cash flow, I'm going to start with 100 million. You're right, I'm going to compute the tax, which in this case, tax rate, which is going to be 32 divided by 80 is 40%. I'm going to take 40% of the 100. It's a hypothetical tax. It will be much higher than the actual tax I pay, but I have to do that because if I don't do it, I'll end up double counting the tax benefits from interest expenses. So if you're ever given a full financial statement, which is what you're often given with a company, you cannot ever take taxes paid and subtract from EBIT to come up with after-tax operating income because you're going to overstate the cash flows and overstate the value of the company. I mean, we sit down value company, we want to put in growth, and you've seen a version of this graph before where we talked about how long growth lasts at a typical growth company. So let's say you're sitting down to value WeWork. It's going to go public sooner or later, right? And probably hold off after today. You know? For many of you, your stock probably started as a sell this morning. It could be a buy by this evening in case you haven't been watching the market. It's how one day can change your recommendation. Right? So let's suppose you're valuing WeWork, you know, and you say it's a high growth firm. You're saying, how many years of high growth should I allow? You know, I'll give you choices. You can do less than five years, five, ten, more than ten years. And you're saying it's a really high growth firm. Why shouldn't I go with more than ten years? There's no reason why you shouldn't. But here's why you should be cautious. This is actually from that IPO study that looked at how long revenue growth lasted at a typical high growth firm that goes public, and this study found that one year after the IPO, the growth rate was 15% higher, two years later it was 7% higher, three years high, later it was 3% higher, by the fifth year, that growth rate had converged. The typical growth firm doesn't grow for very long, three to five years. So when we use a 10-year growth period, if somebody says, how come you're not using a longer growth period? The response should be, 10 is already at the 90th or the 95th percentile for growth periods, so I'm not saying you cannot use a 20-year or 25-year growth period, but the reason you don't do it is you're already valuing your company to be an exception. And if you do that, there's nothing left on the table for you as an investor. So now I'm going to hit you with a cost of capital calculation. There are at least six mistakes I've made in this cost of capital calculation. And I want you to find at least five of those six. Okay? So I'll, I'll go through the process of how I computed cost of capital. I want you to keep a checklist and say, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. So let's start off. First thing I did to get a risk-free rate is I looked at today's T-bond rate and said it looks too low relative to history. I normalized my T-bond rate. I mean, we just normalized operating income for Exxon Mobil. Why can't I normalize risk? So I'd start with a normalized risk-free rate. Hold off on the mistakes till I've gone through the whole list. So we'll go through one. So I normalized it. For the beta, I looked, went to Bloomberg. I used the adjusted beta from Bloomberg. After all, it's right there. It's adjusted, so I went to the adjusted beta. For the equity risk premium, I used the historical equity risk premium for the US. This is a company that gets 20% of its revenues from Brazil. So I also added a small firm premium. Small firm premium comes from looking at historical data, and small cap stocks have earned about 3% more than large cap stocks. It's, very, you know, it's a common practice. So I've, I've added that 3%. So to get my cost of equity, then the 14%, it's risk-free rate plus beta times equity risk premium, the historical premium, plus the 3% small cap premium. To get my cost of capital, I start with the 14% cost of equity. I did use market value of equity because I remember being told, you know, you have to use market value weights. For the cost of debt, I could not find a rating or a default spread, so I used a book interest rate. What's a book interest rate? It's interest expense divided by book value of debt. It's 3%. I multiply that by 1 minus the effective tax rate because I look for a tax rate in the financials, the only tax rate I could find. And then when it got to looking at what debt was, I looked at the library and I got confused. I said, you know, should I count that as debt? And then I decided to be conservative and count everything that was not equity as debt because I want to be conservative. So let me... Uh, as I said, I've, I've listed out, I said there are at least six mistakes. Let's start with the first one. What's the first mistake I made? So tell me now why I should normalize risk free rates. A 20% of valuation that I see on the street now normalize risk free rates. 
Tell me what you mean by a real opportunity cost. If I had the cash, I would have gone and bought this P bond, not a normalized P bond. You can't get a normalized P bond, right? That's a problem. There is no such thing. Unlike normalizing income or normalizing margins, this is what I can make elsewhere. And bitching and moaning about how low it is today is going to get me nowhere. Replacing it with something I wish I could make doesn't make it better. You can never normalize a risk free rate. Or if you do, you're asking for trouble because I'm not sure what you do with the valuation that comes out of this. So first thing I should have done is not normalize the risk rate. Second is easy. I use the adjusted beta from Bloomberg, rip it apart. What's wrong with that? Because you're going to have a lot of people using adjusted beta valuations. So let's see if you're ready to take them to the cleaners. So what, the, what are the problems with the adjusted beta? Let's start. What, what do you think? It's two-thirds, one-third. In fact, it's not a random number. It's the exact problem. It's actually a fixed number for every one of the 40,000 companies. So, so they start with a regression base. So the first problem is it's really not adjusted. Well, I'm still stuck with the regression beta, right? So at least you fixed it at equity. But what's the problem with the regression beta? One is noisy. I like that word. Now, I use it all the time. But somebody's going to say, what the hell do you mean noisy? What does that mean? It's got a big standard error. That's basically what noisy is. It's backward looking. Why? Because I looked at the last two years or five years. And if my company's changed, not just in terms of leverage, but in terms of business mix, this beta is not going to work. And finally, if I asked you what the beta for Uber was two weeks ago, if the only way you could get a beta is by looking up the adjusted beta on Bloomberg, you were stuck, right? There is no adjusted beta for private companies. So what should we do instead? So I hope that, I think I've kind of, made my biases pretty clear on this one. There's no, I, 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 from my perspective, a regression bait is a dangerous number to build an entire valuation. I go to the businesses you're in. Of course, we've got to make assumptions. There. We've got to find comparables. You've got to come up with betas. You've got to clean them up. But at least I control the process, not some number that comes at me from a Bloomberg. So I should have used a beta that reflects the businesses you're in and the, the leverage you have. And I can be forward looking. If your business mix is changing, I can reflect that. For the equity risk premium, first I want forward looking, which in my case is what? What do I use instead of a historical premium? I use an implied premium. And the argument there is, of course, I've got to make assumptions with an implied premium. But the standard error on an implied premium is much smaller than the standard error on a historical premium. It's 0.2% versus 2%. And second, it's dynamic. Today is a perfect day for explaining why, you know all your valuations are now defunct? The equity risk premium used on Friday is too low, and it's not your fault. The world shifted under you. In fact, while you were doing your project report last week, the world kept shifting under you while you were doing it, right? It is what it is. At the end of today, the equity risk might be up to 6%. day like today, that's exactly what happens, the implied premium. It's forward looking and it's dynamic. And how do I reflect this Brazil thing? What do I need to do then? Is I need to bring in your exposure to Brazilian risk. You can't just say I'm a US company, therefore I don't care. So my equity risk premium should reflect a forward looking number and have a Brazil exposure. What do you think about the small cap premium? Should it? Okay. So what's the rationale that people give for small cap premiums? Small companies are riskier than larger companies. And look, if you look backwards, small companies have earned a higher premium. Let's take the second half of that. Small companies historically have earned more than large cap companies after adjusting for beta. That's what makes it a small cap premium. It's even if you adjust for betas, small cap stocks seem to earn more. They earn about 3% more. If you look from 1928 through 2018. But two problems with that small cap premium. One is, remember how the historical risk premium comes with the standard error? The small cap premium comes with the standard error of about 2.5%. So you've got a 3% premium, a 2.5% standard error. The first thing you can't reject statistically is that it's pure noise. The second is, do you know that 90% of the small cap premium is earned in one month of the year? Which month do you think that is? It's actually January. Every January is when 90% of the small cap premium. Nobody knows why. It just seems a mystery. And that premium exists only if you go back all the way to 1928. Since 1981, 
Do you know how much the premium has been? Minus 0.2%. And people still use a small cap premium because you go back to 1928, it looks like it's there. It's gone. It's been gone for 37 years. So if you see small cap premiums used, I think we need to ask why. We can't just say well, everybody does it, it's okay. It's just a bad practice that's embedded there. So my cost of equity is going to use the, the actual risk free rate, a bottom up beta, a forward looking premium that also includes the Brazilian exposure and have no small cap premium. Let's go to the rest of the equation. For my cost of debt, my argument was you didn't give me a rating, so I used a book interest rate. There is actually, I mean, you don't even have to go very far to know that this cost of capital doesn't hold up. Cost of debt pre-tax is 3%. What's the risk-free rate the analyst is using? He's using 5%. So I don't even have to go far to say this doesn't work. Because your risk-free rate, according to your own logic, is 5%. And I can borrow money at 3%. You've already allowed me to create this hugely subsidized company. So first problem is it doesn't even make sense. But even if it did make remote sense, what's the problem with using a book interest rate? What does it capture? The rate at which you borrowed money in the past. And if I want to make the rate lower, I'm going to tilt towards the shorter end of the term structure simply because shorter term. And that's why with the cost of debt and cost of capital, what we're looking for is a forward-looking long-term cost of debt. You think, what do I do if I don't have a rating? We know what to do, right? What do we do with companies that don't have ratings? We try to estimate a rating. It's easier for some companies than others, as some of you found out. But you have to use a forward-looking, long-term cost of borrowing. What about the tax rate? It should be the marginal tax rate for a simple reason. Interest expenses saves you taxes at the margin. You think, what does that even mean? Well, if I have a million dollars in income and $100,000 in interest expenses, my taxable income is 900000 Where I saved on taxes was in the last 100000 it's the marginal tax rate. And finally, for the debt ratio, I tried to be conservative and counted everything. But is that conservative? What does that do to my cost of capital? I count everything as debt. My debt ratio goes up. My cost of capital goes down. If this is your definition of conservative, I'd like to see what your definition of daring would be. Because ending up with a lower cost of capital, to me, is not conservative. So six mistakes, right? Wrong risk free rate, wrong beta, wrong risk premium, forgot the, forget about the small cap premium, forgot all about Brazil, used to book interest rate. And don't be surprised, as you get out there and people talk about cost of capital, always do, do your due diligence because it's amazing how sloppy this practice can be even at established, I mean, people who do this every day, they get into bad habits. So here's what I did to change. Basically I changed the current to an actual T-bond rate I took the adjusted beta and made it a bottom-up beta. I took the EBITs and premium and used an implied premium. I removed the small cap premium, but I included a country risk adjustment for the fact that they are exposed to Brazil. My cost of equity is 15.68% with those adjustments, which is higher than the 14%. For the cost of debt, I replaced the 3% with the synthetic rating based 9% cost of debt. I used the marginal tax rate on it. And before I use the marginal tax rate, though, what do I need to check? To get, you need to have enough operating income to cover the interest expense. If you're a money losing, if you're doing this on Tesla, you might say, look, you know, I don't care that you can get a tax benefit in the future. Right now, you're not getting a tax benefit. So then marginal tax rate. I should, no, I should have enough operating income to work. I have an after-tax cost of debt of 5.4%. I use only interest-bearing debt and leases as my debt, not all liabilities. And finally, I end up the cost of capital at 12.6% rather than the 8.05%. So try this as an exercise. Next time you see a cost of capital calculation, take it through component by component to see what you get. Now let's talk about growth. Right? So basically what you have here is a set of, I mean, remember most valuations, if you ask people where do you get your cash flows, they come from the management of the company. So let's say I'm the management of a company. I supply you with these cash flows. And I tell you, look, I know my business, these are my forecasts. So directly you don't want to confront me on any assumptions. If you say your growth rate is wrong, then I'm going to say, what do you know about the business? I know this business. Your margins are wrong, again I'm going to push back. So I want you to take my story and essentially confront me with contradictions in my own story. 
So as you look at those numbers, how would you check to see whether the story is a plausible story? First, let's start with the revenue growth rate, 10%. How do you check to see if it's plausible? You look to see if it's a small company in a big market, a big company in a small market. So if you have a 10% growth rate and your market share goes from 80% to 105%, that's not possible. So the first thing is you want to make sure the market exists. Right? It's the next thing you're going to check. So basically, am I reinvesting in this company? Yes. How much am I reinvesting? In fact, I'm, I made things easy for you because I kept the reinvestment a certain percentage. If you work it out, it's 20% of my after-tax operating income every year. It seems reasonable, right? But I'm assuming a 10% growth rate. So if I have a 20% reinvestment rate and a 10% growth rate, what's the question you're going to ask me to see if this is plausible? What's your return on invested capital right now? And if I say it's 12%, you have me nailed. Why? Because what's the implicit return on capital I'm assuming if I have a growth rate of 10% and a reinvestment rate of 20%? I'm assuming a return on capital of 50%, 10 divided by, remember the equation that ties them together. If I'm earning only 12% and I'm assuming these numbers, all you need to ask me is where are these new projects coming from? Because they can't be coming from your existing business because your existing business generates returns on capital of only 12%. What I'm saying is when you face cash flow forecast, rather than you disagreeing with the person on, I don't like your growth rate, essentially take that story and make it, you know, say, do you agree with yourself? Because you're giving me this growth rate, but the reinvestment you're giving me is at war with your growth rate. It's that valuation triangle. Remember we looked at that when we were talking about when one side is growth, reinvestment, and risk, you're seeing if there's an inconsistency in the triangle. Let's keep working on this cost of capital thing. So let's assume that I tell you that the cost of capital for Hormel is based on a 90% equity, 10% debt ratio. I come up with a cost of capital of 6.8%. So that's their existing debt ratio. First, I tell you the target debt ratio for this company is 30%. A lot of valuations that I see use a target debt ratio, which raises the question, where did that target come from? We'll kind of set that to the side. If I ask you what the cost of capital of Hormel Foods will be at a 30% debt ratio, you don't have to give me the exact number, but tell me what I cannot do. I can't keep the cost of equity and cost of debt fixed and change the weights to 70 and 30, right? Because if I do that, what's going to happen? My cost of capital will always go down. It's a math problem. My cost of debt is lower than the cost of equity. Just, so what's the right thing to do? What do I need to do as my debt ratio goes from 10 to 30%? First, the interest rate will have to go up because I'll be riskier. I'll have a computer synthetic rating. And what has to happen to my cost of equity? My bait has to be unlevered. You almost have to make this second nature. Every time the debt ratio changes, whether you like betas or not, some way of adjusting cost of equity because you cannot leave the cost of equity the same because as an equity investor in this firm, you're facing more risk. So you're going to end up with a cost of capital. That's different. That's the only thing you can say from 7.31%. In this case, it actually does drop to 7%. Why? Because Hormel Foods is under level. That's actually the definition of under or over level is as you raise your debt ratio, does your cost of capital go up or down? So now you decide to value the company. Should I value the company using its actual debt ratio or its target debt ratio? If you have the power, so help me out, under what conditions would I have the power to change the debt? If I'm doing a, an acquisition of the company of any sort, then I can say, look, I'll use the target debt ratio. If you're a passive investor, never value a company with a target debt ratio because who knows who will run the company. And so if you're working as a buy side analyst for Fidelity or Janus and you say that company is under level, just let it be. This is not your company. You can't just go around changing debt ratios because you feel like it. So just because you have a target, and if you really are doing target debt ratios right, you know how most people get target debt ratios, right? They look at the peer group, and they say, they're at 30, I'm at 10. If you want to do it right, what should you do? You should actually take this company apart, look at what happens to its cost of capital as you go from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40, which requires that you compute the cost of equity and the cost of debt. Find the debt ratio at which your cost of capital is minimized, and that should be your target, not an industry average. But that might be asking for way too much. Let's get to the terminal value. To get the terminal value, there are three ways I can get there. 
One is used to stable growth model and compute the present value of a growing perpetuity, that magical equation we use. The second is to use a multiple of EBITDA or EBIT or an exit multiple of some sort. The third is to estimate a liquidation value for the assets of the company. Two of these three are okay. First, let's rule out the one that is not okay. Which one should you never do? Okay, you better have a lot of ammunition with you. Because if you're going into banking, 90% of your DCFs will be, the terminal value will be an exit multiple. And you will lose this argument. Because even though you're on the right side, I'll tell you, you're on the right side. Don't even, so don't try to drag me into the argument. I am not going to be involved. The reason an exit multiple is going to win is the deal's got to go through. And it's so much easier to do it with an exit multiple. But what's your argument against using an exit multiple? What am I, what, what am I doing wrong? I'm making the biggest number in my intrinsic valuation to a pricing. I'm creating this unholy mess of something that is mostly pricing and part DCF. I'm not even sure whether I've done an intrinsic, at least do one or the other, right? So you may make it a pricing, just make it a pricing. Don't bring in this DCF front. And when would I use liquidation value as opposed to terminal value? One is sell the company. Second is if it's a private company and there's a limited life, there's a key person involved. The third could be if you're looking at a company like J.C. Penney, where there is no going concern at the end. The end game might be at the end of 10 years, I'm going to liquidate my real estate and take whatever I want. So there are conditions. Well, there are exceptions rather than the rule, but leave open that possibility. So let's build on that growth rate forever. Let's say we're valuing a company. The company expects to make $120 million in after-tax earnings next year and to continue generating those earnings in perpetuity, zero growth. I'll make the numbers really easy so you don't need um, a calculator. Cost of equity is 10% based upon a risk-free rate and a risk premium. What's the value, this, the terminal value? $120 million after-tax operating income, no growth. Cost of equity is 10%, it's going to be 120 million, right? Basically, there's no growth, there's no reinvestment, so the after-tax operating income is your free cash flow. Let's say I throw in a 2% growth rate forever. It's a terminal value now. Just, a math, just if you just keep it as pure math, you're saying, now my denominator is 0 0.10 minus 0 0.02, so my value went from 1.2. 2 billion to 1.5, this seems magical, right? Because then if I make it through, what am I doing wrong if I just adjust the denominator? If I have a 2% growth rate in perpetuity, my numerator also has to change. And what have I not given you as information to finish the problem there? You need a return on capital in perpetuity, which you can use to compute a reinvestment or a reinvestment rate in perpetuity. That's why when you get to terminal value, we make this big deal of what's your return on cap forever. Without it, I'm lost because I can't even tell you what the terminal value should be. And in fact, if I make the return on capital exactly equal to my cost of capital, what will happen to my terminal value? Absolutely nothing, right? Because whatever I gain then by having a higher growth rate, I will exactly lose in my cash flows. So whenever you see these DCF problems, when you get to that terminal year, remember to restart everything. Don't take your year five number and just grow it out. Always do a year six or a year 10 or a year four, whichever the terminal year is, because you, the rules have to be different if you're a mature company. So let's say that um, you valued a company by discounting free cash flow as a firm at the cost of capital. You come up with 100 million. I'm going to list items, and I want you to tell me, to get to, and to get to value of equity, whether you're going to add this item, subtract this item, or ignore this item. There's only three choices, add, subtract, or ignore. Right? So I've taken free cash flow to the firm, discounted the cost of capital. I tell you they have a cash balance of $15 million. Add, subtract, or ignore. And tell me why. Because the income from cash is not part of my cash flows. If I did a dividend discount model, I don't add it on because then the income from cash is already part of my cash flows. Because I took free cash for the firm and this kind of the cost of capital, I'm going to add the 15. So somebody keep a running tab. So I'm at 115. Debt outstanding, add, subtract, or ignore. And because I'm an equity investor, the debt has to be paid off, so I'm at 95. I have a 5% holding in another company. The book value of the holding is 5 million. The market value of equity in this company is 200 million. First, add, subtract, or ignore, and then I'll ask you how much. 
this is now we're getting to that cross holding thing that gave you headaches on that second or second quiz, right? Yeah. Well, if it's only five percent, you can't consolidate it, right? Okay. So basically, you're going to add, and the reason you're adding is because it's a minority holding. That income shows up below your operating income line. You got to add five percent now. As, uh, what do I add? Do I add the five million or five percent of two hundred million? I'm going to do 5% of 200 million, but I'm going to cross my fingers as I do it. Why? Because I'm doing an intrinsic valuation. I don't like book value, but I'm also not quite. So if I have an intrinsic value, I would like to use it. But given the choice between book value and market value, I'm going to take the market value. And if you have minority interest of 10 million, add, subtract, or ignore. When I say minority interest, what am I telling you? that I have a consolidated company, that I counted the whole company, that I own, own the whole company. This is very confusing. Minority holding is on the asset side. Minority interest is on the liability side. But that's exactly what cross holdings create for us. I'm going to subtract the minority interest. So I'm going to take 100. I'm going to add the cash. I'm going to subtract our debt. I'm going to, to add this 5% holding, 5% of 200. Then I'm going to subtract out the minority interest. And you can see with each one how confusing it gets, because you're thinking, do I add, subtract? Always go back to that key question. Have I already valued this when I did my free cash with the firm? If the answer is yes, then you shouldn't be adding it on. You might have to subtract something. But if you haven't counted it yet, this is your last chance to do it. The value of equity would reflect all those adjustments. What if I told you that the firm has been targeted in a lawsuit? You see this morning the Supreme Court has ruled that Apple's monopoly on its operating system apps could potentially be challenged in court. It would be a pretty substantial loss of value, right? Let's assume that you know that the payout will be 100 million if you lose. What's the number I need to estimate then to complete my valuation? The likelihood that I will lose the lawsuit, if it's 15 percent, I'll take 15 percent of 100 million. The mopping up you do is to basically, as an equity investor, say, I want to make sure that what I'm getting is what I think I'm getting. Now let's finish up the last few ends. Let's say you come up with a value of equity in a firm of 200 million, and you have 10 million shares outstanding. Value per share is going to be 200 divided by 10 is $20, right? Let's say this company grants 2 million options with a strike price of $20 a share. They're at the money options. What will the effect on my value per share be? Down, up, unchanged. I'm giving the options at the money, right? Down, why? Because options have time premium. When I grant that option, it's a share of my equity leaving the company. That's why we value options as options and subtract them from the value of equity before dividing by the number of shares. And the last page, my final layer of hell, is the Wasserstein Perella bonus layer. You see, I don't know whether you remember this page, but this is, remember the, the acquisition that first Boston did of carborundum, where they estimated cash flows after debt payments to carborundum. And then I gave you a choice of four different discount rates, acquiring company, target company, cost of equity, cost of capital. So let's go through. First, the cash flows after debt payments, so I should be focusing on cost of equity or cost of capital? Cost of equity, because they're after debt payments. If they're before debt payments, I'd have used cost of capital. And this one should be fresh in your mind. Acquiring company or target company's cost of equity? Target company's cost of equity. They should have used 16 and a half. Do you remember what they actually use? They use 10 and a half percent. Wrong company, wrong discount rate. This is about as far from the right answer as you can get. Yeah. And I would, the cynical part of you says, well, they had to get the deal done. I just think somebody screwed up. I think there's you know, valuation, kind of an afterthought. The deal has to get done. This happens all the time. So now we're ready to visit your numbers, right? So I asked you to, yeah, go ahead. Uh, some person will use consolidation. If you did proportional consolidation, then, it'll, no, it's not, that's not the rule anymore. Equity approach is basically, used unless you have no role in management, so even 5%, you very quickly will end up with the, the equity approach. It's very difficult to get passive consolidation. No. So first I asked you which model you use. This was kind of a overwhelming. Yeah. Most of you use firm valuation because I 
talked you into it, right? Because I said you can use equity valuation only when you feel comfortable about leverage staying stable. And I said, if you at all if you feel uncertain about leverage, I said, go. And so firm valuation pretty much was where you got pushed. A few of you did use the dividend discount model, and you can probably guess what companies were valued, right? Mostly banks. In fact, I th every dividend discount model I saw in the submissions yesterday out of the 680, every single one of them that used a dividend discount model used to bank. JP Morgan, Wells Fargo. You know. And about 5% use free cash flow equity, which means you're either comfortable with debt ratios or you just completely forgot about the debt ratio assumption. Either way, you know, ended up with that. You pick some strange companies to value. This is, these are the most valued companies. So 18 people in the two classes put together, valued square. 17, Netflix. Maybe this tells me more about where you're spending your time. A lot of Grubhub. What is this thing about Grubhub, you know? Why do you guys like Grubhub so much? What is it that fascinates you about the company? But no. Hey, more, four times more people valued Grubhub than Apple or Amazon. Hey? So, and you know, I'm often asked why I let people value the same company. Here's why. These are all 17 of your Netflix valuations. The price, for the most part, is the same, except I can tell which people did at the start of the week, which is, that was a So basically, the only reason you see 376, 378 is you probably did last Friday, right? There's your DCF value. The highest, I think there's one person I've repeated. Maybe that can't be the same. I think that's the same group. Some of you sent in like two, but um, there's your pricing. The one thing you had consensus on was that this was not a good investment. Though there are a couple of you who told yourself you should hold. <laughs> I don't know why. No, but maybe you have hope. Or maybe you don't trust your DCF or your pricing, but there are an awful lot of holes in this class, a lot of chickening out, right? At the, the last moment, you don't want to make a decision, right? Okay. That's the reason I don't care. You, you know, 50 people can value the same company. It's going to be incredible, incredible coincidence to get even close to the same number. And it's not that one is right and the other is wrong. You're telling different stories, especially with a company like Netflix. Think of all the different stories you can tell, and you're going to end up at very different places. But it is telling that none of the stories led you to a value higher than the market price, which tells you that whatever story you need to tell, tell to get to that price must be such a reach that none of you felt comfortable going there. Right? Here's what you found. The average company in this class was overvalued by about 37%. But before that number freaks you out, that's because you had a few companies that were really, really overvalued. The median company was overvalued by about 7%. 43% of companies were undervalued, 57% were overvalued, which is not that different from most other semesters. If 7% are undervalued, 93% are overvalued. But there again, I've kind of cheated the system by, if you used an implied equity risk premium, kind of push you towards the 40 to 50%, right? Because the implied equity risk premium reflects where the market is. So individually, you have to pick companies and work with them. Right? So these are the stocks that you told me. This is like one of those caveats. You know how you get investment banking emails. At the bottom, there's this disclaimer. These are not my recommendations. These are your recommendations that I'm very faithfully reporting back to you. So Thomas Cook looks really, really cheap. Is, is, who, is anybody in this class do Thomas Cook? You don't want to admit to it? No. <laughs> Here's where my challenge comes in. At the, at the end of this process, I'll give you the chance. So, the, so you can, these are the most, and I define undervalued by looking at the percentage difference between the price and the value. Hey, Tesla is there. There's somebody who really likes Elon Musk, I guess. So it's, a, you know, there's a, hey, you have to. You can't like Tesla without really liking Elon Musk. The two are kind of inseparable. And I'm not saying that isn't it. That's, that's the way it is. You're investing in a personality. There were two, the reason I've highlighted those two is in spite of finding them undervalued, you know, match group and, <laughs> no, don't laugh, it might be the pricing. No, but remember, you get, you get a choice of which one do you trust. Now, I'd say you have to trust your DCF valuation. So we'll see they also show up on the pricing because then we might have to take issue. Who's doing Cementos Pacasamayo? 
I did this talk and it's just incredibly, 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 incredibly overvalued. Or this, I, I want to take a look at this. I, it's 2,633% overvalued, right? <laughs> Don't read too much into the, into the caps. I'm not, you no know, caps, usually you scream at people and use caps. No, this is just, you sent it as caps. I was too lazy to go fix it. Okay. So there are a couple of Chipotle's on the list, you know. So, and there's square right there. And, and, uh, so most overvalued. And there again, I've listed out the, uh, there's one buy in the most overvalued <laughs> list. So, <laughs> but, it's it's yeah it's i no it's, it could be the pricing or you just, i mean it was late at night you might have got the numbers switched around i don't know no? no i'll give you a chance to back out from any of this none of this has consequences yet there will be at the end no no so those are the most undervalued and overvalued stocks yes have you ever had anyone have like negative yeah there were about 37 companies where the equity value is negative. Usually trouble companies with huge amounts of debt. It's actually very easy to get to a negative equity value. Doesn't mean the stock price has to be negative because that's where the optionality kicks in. You're buying Jet Airways. You're not buying it as a DCF. You're buying it pure option, right? So it, it happens more frequently than people realize. So if it does happen, don't freak out. It can happen with heavily indebted companies. Yeah, it can happen. No. Well, who did you do? I'm not surprised. Right. So it might not, I'm not surprised. So it can very easily happen if your operating asset value drops. So I've actually been tracking this. This will be my 30-something year of these recommendations. So over time, here's what I've been doing. I've I don't buy all these shares. I don't have enough money to go buy like 20 companies. But I've at least tracked the overall portfolio of buys versus sells. And I let, the, you have to have time. If I did this every quarter, there's going to be nothing I learned. So basically, I, you know, I'll wait till about five years after to kind of track what the returns are. This is a five-year return on buys, uh, sells. The buy is the blue, the sell is the green, and the red is the S&P 500. The broad good news is buys do better than sells. Let's get, let's get that out of the way. But the sells don't lose money. They just make less money than the market. You know what? If you could capture that in a mutual fund, you'd be a hero. I mean, this is way beyond. You know, there are practical issues you're going to know. Some of these companies are small. The bid-ask spreads could be huge. Liquidity might dry up. You know. But the broad good news is there's overall look at buys and sells. I'd rather be holding the buy portfolio than the sell portfolio. But I wouldn't be running out to sell short on the sell portfolio because you don't see the massive drop. So I took a closer look at these buy portfolios to see where the excess returns were coming from. So on average, you got the buy, the buy recommendations. got, to the, But usually, it was one big winner that caused the portfolio to do well. So Apple in 99, one of the, one of the buys, it kind of took care. And that's not uncommon. When you make money on a portfolio, it's not because every stock in your portfolio pulls its weight. Those two big winners essentially take, which means if you sell something too soon or buy something, you can have consequences for your overall portfolio. Okay. The returns on buy were, were, were greater on small cap and emerging market companies than they were on developed market and mature companies, perhaps because you bring some information into the process. And stocks were undervalued in both a DCF and a pricing basis did much better than stocks were just undervalued. So if you're both undervalued, and, and that's why I would strongly recommend that you don't make this an either or. When somebody says, I do only intrinsic valuation, I don't care for pricing, I don't understand. Why can't you do both? You can still believe in intrinsic valuation and use pricing as a way of timing this process. But looking across those years, those stocks that come out of I'm going to put the entire list up online after this class. So you're going to be able to see all 680. No names. So don't worry. No, no, your, your identities are fully protected. No? But you can then sort for yourself and see which stocks were both undervalued and underpriced. So that's the intrinsic value part. Then I asked you to price your company. And remember the four-step process for pricing. 
you start off by defining the multiple. Just because Anna Kornikova knows what the PE ratio is doesn't mean you and I are talking about the same PE. So make sure whatever multiple you focus on that you're on the same page. Get the definition. Make sure the multiple is consistently defined, equity, equity, firm, firm, and that it's uniformly estimated because you're comparing across companies. And you saw how difficult that was even with your pricing to make sure they were uniformly estimated and that they were consistent. Second. Don't fall for rules of thumb. It's not 1965. You have no excuse for not looking at all of the data. Do you get the access to capital IQ for how long? Until you graduate, and then they'll probably cut it off and ask you to pay money. I don't know, knowing NYU, who knows what they would. This should be one of those things you negotiate for as an alumni freebie, is for maybe not unlimited access. Because it is great to have access to that data, right? to be able to pull that data off. Because pulling it off Yahoo Finance, you try it. You know, Try it without capital IQ, and you'll very quickly see why it's so nice to be able to pull the data. And third, you cannot get away without making assumptions. Implicit in every pricing multiple are assumptions about growth and risk and cash flows. And that was the whole point of doing that intrinsic pricing equation for PE and EV to EBITDA. It's not because we ever use it, but to say, these are the variables I want to control for. And then when you try to pull those comparables, you very quickly realize that there's no other company out there that looks just like yours. And you have to control for differences in growth and risk. And that's where statistics comes in. If regressions work for you, they do. If they don't, they don't. And I know many of you struggle with regressions where the T statistics were awful and the R squared were in the toilet. And you kept emailing, so how do I make the R squared go up? And I said, look, don't fight the data. Because there's nothing I can do to make R squareds go up. If nothing explains difference in pricing, I said, build that into your recommendation. Because when you look at pricing multiples, then what I learned from nothing working is this is a sector where there's no rhyme or reason for differences. It's very difficult to use a multiple in a sector like that. So the absence of signif significance is almost as important as the presence of it, because it tells you something about the pricing in that sector. And this page, of course, is a, is a page that lists out all the variables that drive each multiple. It comes right out of your multiple. So you go back and review it. Basically, everything goes back to an intrinsic value model, and you can see the drivers. So here's what you used. A lot of EV multiples, EV to sales and EV to EBITDA, which tells me that you got desperate. You had to keep climbing and climbing and climbing till you got a number that was positive for most of your company. That's what happens when you do square 18 times is you got to go up the ranks. And then there were a couple more EV multiples. 22% PE still hangs, hangs in there as the most widely used equity multiple, some price to book. And some of you picked other. I have no idea what the other is because that's the choice I gave you. So when it comes back, it might, I mean, remember it's pricing. It can be enterprise value to rider, right, for Uber or Lyft, or enterprise value to subscriber. There's no right pricing multiple. It's whatever works. And here's what you found on your pricing relative to your own DCF. So every year I keep track of what your DCF value is in a pricing is. And I'll tell you why this number is a useful macro number. This, sem this semester, for instance, the average DCF was higher than the pricing by 5.85%, but was lower than the pricing, the median was about. So your DCF values and pricing were actually very close for the most part. And the reason I emphasize that, there is this canard about DCF, that it's a conservative way of estimating value, that you really can't value these high growth companies with DCFs because you'll always get too low a value. That might be true if you have a really rigid model, but there's nothing about discounted cash flow valuation that should make your numbers consistently lower. But here's when the difference can show up. If markets consistently start overpricing sectors and you keep picking companies in those sectors, the pricing can be much higher than the DCF for a lot of companies in your in your group simply because of the kinds of companies you pick. So I just keep track of that just to see how the market's done. 53% of companies, the DCF value was actually higher than the, than the and 47%, the pricing was higher than the DCF. So these were the most underpriced stocks, and I see some, let's see, you see why I asked who's doing Thomas Cook? Not only was it underpriced by like a 2,000 something percent, it gets even more underpriced when, you know, when you do it with the when you do it with the multiple, and there are a few companies that show up in both. And again, I, you know, a couple are are duplicates because some groups sent it in. So the Zillow and Via just consolidated into one Zillow and one Via. 
but basically these were the most underpriced on a relative basis. Here are the most overpriced. At the top is Cementos Pacasmayo, as I said, you know, it, 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 it stock is either a total disaster or something's gone wrong. Right? But notice again, with the pricing, you get a much bigger mismatch between what you find in your recommendation because you've got a DCF that's giving you a different answer. You can see why people are looking at the pricing and say, you know what, the pricing gave me a different answer. And that's something that each of you had to negotiate. If your value, if your DCF value and your pricing gave you very different signals about what to do, you had to decide. And there's no right answer. I can't make you decide. And that, the price, you know, many of you picked the DCF over the pricing, partly reflecting, I guess, my biases. For some of you, I said, if you can use an option pricing, usually companies with negative equity values, you know. There were actually 61 companies out of the 680-something, so 10% of companies, roughly speaking, had an equity value. And for those companies where there was an equity component, the premium you got over the DCF value is about 46%. Many of those companies, the equity value, which was negative, you still managed to get a positive value on the option, which might be hope and prayer. But that's the only thing that's sustaining the stock now is that hope that something might happen. So you got all these numbers and then asked you to make a recommendation. It's not kind of unfair of me, right? Because this is a, for, for some of you, this is your first full valuation. Then I'm making you, remember I didn't ask you to put real money behind it. I just say buy, sell, it costs absolutely nothing. Yeah. But this, when you finish the numbers, one of three reactions probably kicked in. One is, no, I'm not sure. And you will never be sure. If you're waiting for certainty, it's never going to come. You got to pull the trigger. But that's, you've got to do it on your own terms. I can't make you pull the trigger. Okay? No. Many of you, after you've gone through this process, might have decided that this market is probably not as stupid as it looks, that this is a lot more difficult. So if you believe in market efficiency now and you didn't at the start of the class, maybe that's a healthy thing that comes out of the class. Okay? And finally, remember, when you put all your money in one stock, you worry a lot more than when you spread your bets. Right, so to the degree that you can do this on multiple stocks, your anxiety level can come down because all you have to do is be right on average. That's why it's so difficult to put a buy or a sell on a single stock, because you're thinking like putting all your money in that stock. And that's absolutely true. It's very difficult to pull the trigger if that's the case. But if you take 5% of your portfolio and you're gonna buy that same stock, all of a sudden the requirement you have for pulling the trigger gets lower. So don't make this a battle between being diversified and picking stocks. You can do both. You can pick stocks and be diversified. In fact, I think it's a much healthier way to go. So here are your final recommendations. There's the 2019 group because you have two classes and numbers. There were 208 buy recommendations. There were about 270 sell recommendations. There were about 135 hold recommendations. The ratio of buy to sell was about 0.7. For every buy, there were you no. Know, for every sell, there were 0.7 buys. So the number of sells outnumbered buys. Last spring 2017, that number was exactly 100%. They were exactly the same number of buys and sells. But you can see the number kind of shoots up and down. So depending on the semester, it's interesting that that number peaked just before, we're not after the crisis. Spring of 2009 is the highest buy to sell ratio that I got. It would have been a great time to buy stocks actually if I'd listened. No. And I actually do one stock every semester I buy. And it's based on that undervalued list. And here's what you would get as an email on that undervalued or you can preempt it and send me the email yourself. And it'll have only three, three words in it, which is, did you buy? And you have three choices. You can ignore the email, in which case I don't buy either. You can say no, in which case I definitely don't buy. <laughs> or you can say yes, and hopefully not lie. <laughs> and then you go on my short list. It's amazing how that list of 20 very quickly becomes a list of three after I've sent the emails out because I can't buy, I don't have the money right now, maybe tomorrow, and I can't buy either then. No. But every, every semester for the last, you know, the last 20 years, I've had that one stock on. It doesn't stay on forever, obviously. And it's actually done reasonably well for me. So I have no reason to believe that, you know. Because it's really, if, if, you, if that 20 did badly, it's time for me to stop teaching this class, right? <laughs> in a sense, it's as much a reflection of what we do in this class as a reflection on you. 
So if you are on that undervalued list and you're really buying, just let me know because I'll come along for the ride. I'll, make, I'll read your report first before I do it, but I will come along for the ride because I don't want to make sure you didn't get the units off or something. And, you know, because that's a, that can sometimes lead to the undervaluation is you just got the number of shares off by 90%. Now, in terms of picking the approach that works best for you, there is no right approach that's going to work for all of us. So which approach you use to attach a number to a company will depend on what you value, right? Whether it's, an, you know, whether it's marketable, what cash flows it has. So if you ask me to value Bitcoin, I can't do it. It doesn't have any cash flows. I can price it, right? And how unique the asset is. And finally, it also depends on you as a person. The longer your time horizon, the better as a candidate you are for intrinsic valuation. What your reasons are for doing the valuation? If you have to get deals done, you have to price things. It's not your job to attach intrinsic value. And finally, what you believe about markets, how they make mistakes and how they correct their mistakes. Remember, in intrinsic valuation, you assume that markets make mistakes and correct them over time. In pricing, you assume markets are right on average but are wrong in individual stocks. You've got to decide for yourself how you think markets work. So I asked you this question. So you don't even have to pick right now. But I'd like you to think about the process you went through and decide for yourself, of all these different valuation approaches, which one you felt most comfortable with, pricing. And as I said, I'm not going to let my, because it's not about what works for me, it's what works for you. So think about those different ways of attaching numbers and decide for yourself what you felt most comfortable doing. And let me return to something that I said at the start of the class. If you are a storyteller, I hope that by the end of this class, you have enough comfort with you. I mean, remember, you'll still stay a storyteller. That's not going to change. Fundamentally, you're a storyteller that you get comfortable enough with the numbers that you can bring them into your stories. And if you're a number cruncher, I hope you're comfortable enough with telling stories. And you will get better if you work on your weak side, because that's really what will make you better at valuation. So I'm going to close off you know, with some very gentle advice. The more things change in this, the more they stay the same. We know what's driven value from the start of time. It's cash flows, growth, and risk. That's never changed. You might use discounted cash flow models. You might use beta to measure risk. But the fundamental drivers of value. So when somebody says the fundamentals have shifted, you don't have to worry about them anymore, don't believe it. The fundamentals always matter. We can debate about how much they matter and what the price of risk is, but you can't tell me risk doesn't matter anymore. Second, try to focus on the big picture. There's so many details in valuation where you can get lost. You've got to step back and say, how does this affect value? So before you spend too much time getting your working capital definition nailed down, ask yourself, does it even matter? Does it even affect value? Third, I mean, a lot of anecdotal evidence out there. There'll be people out there, grizzly veterans, who say, I did this in 2005, it worked for me, and say, Thank, that's very nice, let's move on, because anecdotal evidence really means very little. Some things always work or something hasn't. Look at the data. You know, if you're going to do something at least based on more than anecdotal evidence, keep in perspective. It's only evaluation. No, all it is is money. So what else is there in life? You need some spiritual counseling. Maybe talk to your rabbi, your priest. You know, I can't do it. No. I mean, what's the worst? Thing? I mean, I remember about si maybe seven, eight, nine years ago, end of one of these classes, second year MBA comes up to me. She was a history major from Yale who came back for an MBA. And usually if you're a history major from Yale, you take the strategic MBA route. You know what that is? You pick every class with the word strategic in its name. <laughs> You can go two years without ever seeing a number. I swear. You can go through Stern without ever seeing a number. All you will see is Harvard case study, Harvard case study, Harvard case study, Harvard case study. I've always wanted to sit in on that strategic accounting class. That would be quite interesting. How do you do balance sheets? I'm sure. But Harvard, they can do everything. Everything can balance without numbers. But she actually ended up in this class, which, as you know, is not a strategic class. And she turned out to be pretty good at it. So at the end of the semester, she comes up to me and she says, I never thought this would happen. But I have a job as a sell side equity research analyst. I said, my condolences. No, I said, my congratulations. <laughs> and she said, I'm really scared. And I said, what are you so scared about? She said, what if I make a mistake? I said, be glad you're not a brain surgeon. <laughs> brain surgeon makes a mistake. Somebody dies on the table. You make a mistake. What's the worst that's going to happen? Somebody gets a little richer. 
Somebody else gets a little poorer, just make sure that somebody's getting a little poorer is not you. That's the only requirement. <laughs> Think like a Marxist. You move some wealth around, the world has intended, move on. So that when you get on your job, it's late, 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, you're in this deep debate about bottom-up betas versus Bloomberg betas. You're on the right side of the argument. You want to use bottom-up betas. The other person wants to use Bloomberg betas. My suggestion is just give in. So just use a Bloomberg beta. What's the worst that's going to happen? Somebody gets a little richer. Somebody else gets a little poorer. Move on. It's not worth fighting fights over. And finally, if you're ever given a choice between understanding everything there is to understand about valuation and being lucky, which one should you pick? Pick being lucky. Don't even think about it for a second. I hate to let you in on this, but this is a business where luck is the dominant paradigm. If you're lucky, you can get away with some really crappy stuff. And if you're not, you're completely and totally screwed right now. You might as well just give in. I mean, something brought home to me by my mother-in-law when she came to visit in early 2000. Now, my mother-in-law became an avid investor in the 1990s, which to me should have been a sign that the market was topping off. <laughs> mother-in-law, big-time investor, get out of the market. Now, I kind of missed that sign. And all she would talk about all day, what was in her portfolio, what she wished was in, what was out of her portfolio, and I had to act like I was listening. That's what son-in-laws do. And then she lets it slip. She owned Qualcomm, one of the great stocks of 1999, up 600%. And I fell into the trap. I said, Judy, how do you pick Qualcomm? And she told me. She always does. She said she picked Qualcomm because it owned MCI. I said, that's not Qualcomm, that's WorldCom. She says, WorldCom, Qualcomm, what's the difference? I said, you picked the wrong company. If you really meant to buy the company that owns MCI, you'd have lost 30%. So you buy some other company that rhymes with it and make 600%. I was afraid to ask her after that why she owns Cisco. Afraid the answer might be like the vegetable oil. Yeah. But after she left, I did try a strategy. I'd pick a stock in the news, pick one that rhymes with it. If I'd made a lot of money, forget about this intrinsic value stuff. <laughs> I mean, this whole class would have been rhyming stocks. Let's pick a stock. Let's bring with our arms with it. Let's see whether we can make money. This is a pragmatic exercise. If you can't make money on it, who cares that you lost money in a glorious way? That you did everything right and lost money. If you, if you gave me a pathway to making money where I could just get lucky, 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 I'd take that every single time. It just doesn't seem to work that well for me. One final point, don't forget to do your CFEs. I think the window's open. I'm, do, I'm telling you this from a personal standpoint, because you don't do your CFEs. If you're graduating, can you still check your grades, though? Or do they hold back your, oh, you probably don't even care about your grades. <laughs> the only requirement is you have to pass or not pass, you know? No, but if you don't do your CFEs, then you're going to be emailing me saying, what did I get? No, did I get, no. So if you can do your CFEs, get them out of the way. Finally, as some of you know, I've been commuting this semester from La Jolla, California. It's a long commute. I come out Sunday night. Mondays, by the time I get to this class, I'm already kind of fading. Right? I stay Monday, Wednesday, go back Wednesday night. And a few people in the finance department say, why do you commute so far? And I give them the easy answer. It's La Jolla. It's 70 degrees all the time, and there's a beach two blocks away. But um, that's the reason I commute. That's my grandson, Noah Henry. Right? He's 14 months old, so I get to see him every week. So, yeah. so thank you very much, and I, will, I wish you the very best. Most, how many of you are graduating? Almost everybody here, right? <laughs> right? I, I might see you at graduation. I might not. I might be grading. So it's, uh, you know. But tomorrow's early exam is going to be in Paulson. Right here. Reason being, once it got above 80, then those rooms get really crowded. So it's going to be here 10 to 12. So if you're taking the early exam, come here 10 to 12. If you're taking the regular exam, it'll be a week from today. Okay. I think it's 1 to 3 a week from today. Thank you.
Should I meet you in your office? Okay, perfect. <laughs> probably. Well, I bought it today, so it's probably <laughs> at its fault. <laughs>
Professor, uh, I would love to be uh, teaching in Mexico and Europe. Uh, cool, man. Uh, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. Next week. Yeah. So do you want to keep your corporate finance? Or then evaluation. Yeah. I, I, I'm better at evaluation. <laughs> We're both there, so that's going to uh, – Sam is going to be a PA as well, so, you know, Sam and me can be okay. PAs. Thank you. Thank so you. So we want to interview officially in November, yeah. but reach out to me if you start in November, and I'll put you in touch with the finance person. But Finance already have a PA? No, do you want to be PA for Clock Finance? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'll send you an email. Absolutely. Thank you. One more. Thank you. 